how do you do? Good evening, everybody. Thank you all for coming. Delighted to have you here, as usual, and I hope everybody, we have several overflow rooms, so I hope I'm coming through loud and clear there. Uh, my name is Tom Morgan. I'm the director of the Allworth Center for the Study of Peace and Justice, and this is lecture number four uh, in a series of talks on the overarching theme, Is Religion a Force for Good or Ill? Um, we've had three others before this. That's what makes this the fourth, doesn't it? It's uh, sponsored, as always, by or the Allworth Center for the C Peace, Study of Peace and Justice with a generous uh, donation from the Allworth family, funded also in part by the Warner Lecture Series of the Manitou Fund, uh, the DeWitt and Carolyn Van Evra Foundation, and by Mary C. Van Evra in memory of William Van Evra, a former trustee of the college. Additional support has been received from Reader Weekly of Duluth and from other private donors. Thank you again to all of you for coming and for our supporters who make these lectures happen. Uh, before I get into tonight's business, I just want to promote a couple of other lectures that are coming up, not part of this series, but actually related to the topic of this series. And the first one is on Wednesday, April 8th. And this is a part of our Shea lecture series. This lecture will be at 7 p.m. New Testament scholar John Dominic Crossan will speak on how to read the Bible and still be a Christian. Deals with issues of violence uh, in the Bible and that maybe don't apply to Jesus Christ. And uh, by the way, that is the topic of next year's Peace and Justice series, too, issues of violence, but we'll get to that later. So the Shea Lecture Series with uh, John Dominic Crossan, 7 p.m., 7 p.m., April 8th. And then on April 14th, Six days later, the Oric Alprin Interreligious Forum presents a lecture at 7.30 p.m. And this is featuring Muslim nurse and activist Naja Bazi on her topic is Hope in Humanity, Islamic Principles of Neighborly Kindness. That lecture is April 14, 7.30 p.m. in this auditorium. But back to business for tonight. Um, as you regulars know, after these lectures, we get together again a few days later uh, and kind of chew over what we heard and critique it and talk about it a little bit. And you all should have had these flyers, even the people in the, uh, in the outlying areas and the remote sites. I hope you have this information. Uh, the talk back this next week will be with David Broman, uh, and that will be here in Tower Hall at the college, 4119, uh, next Tuesday at 7 p.m. And uh, information, I won't read it all to you because you can all read about David Broman, who's been very much supportive, and Lake Superior Freethinkers have been very supportive of this series throughout the year. So he's going to be conducting the talk back on that. After the lecture, as you all know, we have question and answer, and you're invited to uh, step up to these microphones and ask questions of our speaker. Uh, and as usual, I ask you to give preference to the students. We want them to ask the questions first because, because they're why we're here, and that's why we're in business. That's one reason. So I. I think it's really important that we allow the students to have their voices and to ask questions. Uh, there are sign-up sheets in the lobby. Uh, if you haven't signed up for our uh, mailing list and Facebook and however else we communicate with you, uh, I invite you to do that after the talk. After the talk, by the way, there's a, a little reception and our speaker will be there to talk more with you on the topics that he will address. Uh, and those of you who are in remote sites, come on over here and there's free food and more wisdom in the auditorium or in the lobby of the auditorium here at Mitchell. By the way, our speaker this evening is not David Bentley Hart, author of Atheist Delusions and the Experience of God. 
He was originally scheduled, but unfortunately, Professor Hart is unable to be here due to health issues. Fortunately, we have a very capable substitute in the person of my colleague, Professor Randall Poole, and this is a first for me. We're showcasing now one of our own, Dr. Poole here at the College of St. Scholastic. And please permit me now to issue this public expression of gratitude to Randall for responding to my challenge to give this lecture. Randall, you are a great American. <laughs> <laughs> professor uh, Poole is a professor of history here at the College of St. Scholastica, where he also teaches in the college's Dignitas program for first-year students and in the college's honors program. He did his own undergraduate work at Cornell University and his master's and PhD degrees are from the University of Notre Dame. Before coming to CSS in 2004, he taught at the University of Notre Dame and at Boston University. He has held research fellowships at New York University, the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, Stanford University, Columbia University, the Keenan Institute for Advanced Studies, and the Institute of Philosophy of the Russian Academy of Sciences in Moscow, where he was a Fulbright Scholar. He also has been a faculty, faculty, uh, faculty fellow of the International uh, History Institute at Boston University and an associate of the Davis Center for Russian and Eurasian Studies at Harvard. In the spring of 2012, he was visiting professor of Russian intellectual history at the University of Toronto. Professor's Pool, Professor Poole's uh, research and writing focus on Russian and European intellectual history, the history of ideas, and the history of philosophical and religious thought. Since 1990, he has delivered more than 50 scholarly papers here and abroad, and he's published more than 20 articles and book chapters. Professor Poole tells me that his interest in the history of humanism comes out of his interest in Russian history and his discovery of Russian thinkers as early as the Enlightenment era who were ardent champions of liberal human values despite the oppressive nature of Russian and Soviet regimes under which they lived. He has translated, edited, and introduced Problems of Idealism, Essays in Russian Social Philosophy, published by Yale University Press in 2003, and co-edited with G.M. Hamburg, A History of Russian Philosophy, 1830 to 1930, published by Cambridge University Press in 2010. So Professor Poole, like me, is a bit of a Russophile, and when he's not thinking about Russian philosophy and humanism, he joins me and our other colleague, uh, Professor Karen Rosenflanz, who teaches Russian here at the college, and other Russian speakers at our Russian table gatherings at Sir Benedict's restaurant on Friday evenings. That's tomorrow. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome my wonderful colleague and friend, Dr. Randall Poole. <clears throat> Thank you. Very, very nice. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed for that very generous introduction, Tom. It is a pleasure and a, pri a privilege to be with you here this evening. I realize that some of you uh, are a captive audience, but I hope to soon dispel any desire for you to escape. Uh, I have just a few. I have just a few preliminary uh, remarks before I get into. Uh, before I get into my lecture this evening. Uh, first of all, I suppose I should, I should thank David Bentley Hart for canceling so that I could take his place. This is a talk about humanism, so I want to be sure to thank the philanthropist, uh, which means lovers of humanity, who sponsor this series, uh, in particular the Alworth family. This is my 11th year at St. Scholastica, and I am very grateful to all of my friends and colleagues who support me in projects such as this one and in a lot of other things as well. In particular, I want to thank Tom Morgan for having the confidence uh, in me to do this, and I want to thank 
Brett Amundsen for his expert help with the PowerPoint. All right. Uh, the last time I rehearsed this, uh, it ran to about an hour, uh, maybe a little bit uh, short of that. So um, I expect that I expect that I'll lecture for about uh, an hour, and then uh, we'll have opportunity for questions. Uh, so the true meaning of humanism. That's the topic I will uh, try to address this evening. Humanism is one of the great movements and also one of the great controversies in modern intellectual history. Let me begin with a broad definition. Humanism is the defense and promotion of human values and of human flourishing. Its goal is a more humane world and progress toward that goal is to be achieved through reason and ethics of human dignity, uh, empathy, respect for human dignity, and human rights. Certainly, the vast majority of humanists would accept that definition. Many people share the same ideals, even those who don't normally call themselves humanist. Humanism can be defined even more simply. Respect for human dignity for the intrinsic and insuperable value of being human, for the principle that every person is an end in itself and ought never to be treated merely as a means. If we accept that definition, then humanism can claim an essential truth, perhaps even the essential truth. So there already is a large part of what I mean by the title of my talk this evening. The true meaning of humanism is respect for human dignity. So, where's the controversy? The controversy is over religion. Does it help or hinder humanism? Is humanism better with or without it? In short, is religion a force for good or ill? That question frames this year's Alworth Peace and Justice Lecture Series, and it is the question that I want to explore this evening. For most humanists today who wear that name as a badge of honor, there really is no controversy. They maintain that religion is a force for ill and that human progress depends on the end of faith. As prominent humanist Sam, Sam Harris put it in the title of his 2004 book, which became a New York Times bestseller. He's worth quoting. Religious faith, he says, represents so uncompromising a misuse of the power of our minds that it forms a kind of perverse cultural singularity, by that he means a type of black hole, a vanishing point beyond which rational discourse proves impossible. When foisted upon each generation anew, it renders us incapable of realizing just how much of our world has been unnecessarily seeded to a dark and barbarous past. So that's an example of how it's almost a matter of definition that present day humanism defines itself in opposition to religion. To put that in historical context, let me say a few words about the term itself, humanism. It was coined in the early 19th century by German educational reformers who wanted to promote a curriculum based on the humanities especially the study of ancient Greek and Latin, and more generally, of classical literature, history, and culture. The new term, derived from a Renaissance-era word, humanisti, whose outlook was hardly irreligious. In fact, as we will see, Renaissance humanism was a type of religious humanism, even if the humanisti did not use the abstract term humanism. Since the Renaissance, religious humanism has had some prominent champions, including the great 20th century Catholic philosopher Jacques Maritain, who was one of the intellectual architects of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. But the religious variant is an outlier among modern day forms of humanism, which by and large define themselves as secular, irreligious, or atheistic. Once the term came into use, it did not take long for it to be associated with atheism or secularism in the sense of non-religious. Already by 1844, Karl Marx, 
the same Marx for whom religion was the opiate of the masses gave it that association. He wrote that communism, quote, as fully developed naturalism equals humanism, and as fully developed humanism, communism equals naturalism. Naturalism is a more precise term for atheism. It is the view that there is no reality except the natural universe in space and time, and that everything, for example, the human mind, can ultimately be reduced to naturalistic processes. Marx's identification of humanism with naturalism or atheism set the basic humanist agenda down to our own times. One of today's best known humanists is A.C. Grayling, a British philosopher and intellectual. He looks like a kind and good person, doesn't he? Um, in fact, uh, in Great Britain, he teaches in Great Britain, he is known as the friendly humanist, and I believe the contrast there is to Richard Dawkins. The title of his 2013 book is characteristic, The God Argument, The Case Against Religion and uh, for Humanism. If, by the way, uh, when I uh, depart from the podium and walk around, if that's distracting, let me know, and I'll return and curl up and diminish myself behind the podium. So, uh, in his book, A.C. Grayling writes, there he writes, <clears throat> in a truly secular world, one where religion has withered to the relative insignificance of astrology and other superstitions, there in that world, an ethical outlook which can serve everyone everywhere and can bring the world together into a single moral community will at last be possible. That outlook is humanism." End quote. Another British philosopher, Stephen Law, is the author of The Handy Guide, A Very Short Introduction, Humanism, A Very Short Introduction. He lists seven main characteristics of humanism. First, humanists, uh, humanists rely on science and reason. Second, humanists are either atheist or at least agnostic. They believe that this life is the only life we have. Next, regardless of, it, regardless of its atheism or agnosticism, humanism law continues involves a commitment to the existence and importance of moral value, in particular to individual moral autonomy. Humanists believe that human life can have meaning without it being bestowed from above by God. And finally, Law says that humanists are secular, secularists in that they think that the state should take a neutral position with respect to religion. In the United States, perhaps the most prominent humanist was Paul Kurtz, who died in 2012. He called his movement secular humanism and regarded religious skepticism as one of its hallmarks. He was fond of writing manifestos and declarations, and let me quote just one of them for a summary of his views on religion. He begins by recognizing that religious experience is important for people but denies that, quote, such experiences have anything to do with the supernatural. He continues, we find that traditional views of the existence of God are either meaningless, have not yet been demonstrated to be true, or are tyrannically exploitative. And there is much more along these lines. So from these representative examples, it is clear that most humanists today think that religion is a force for ill, or at least not for the good. Why? Their basic argument goes something like this. Religion places God above man and in the process debases the human. It exalts the divine and devalues the human. People waste their time and energy worshiping God and worrying about the next world, rather than concentrating their efforts on improving this world, the only one we know. Religion is not only a waste, they say, it actually makes the world worse since we persecute, fight, and kill each other over it. They especially l lament religious violence because there is nothing to fight over. There is no God so far as we know. 
In other words, humanists oppose religion for two different types of reasons. The first can be classified as broadly ethical. Religion is held to undermine the defense and promotion of human values and well-being, which is the very purpose of humanism. The second type of argument can be called epistemic. Epistemic is an adjectival form of epistemology, the branch of philosophy that deals with the theory of knowledge. The epistemic argument is that even were religion not harmful to human values, still there are no rational grounds for belief in God, so a commitment to truth demands that we debunk such belief. Over the past 10 years or so, the epistemic argument in particular has been stridently advanced by a group of thinkers known as the New Atheist. They claim that science proves belief in God to be a delusion, to paraphrase the title of one of their most famous books. In sum, Humanists oppose religion because they maintain that it is violence, that it is violent and that its ideas are false. In the rest of my lecture, I will try to address each of these two different types of reasons for thinking that religion is a force for ill. I will devote the most time to the first and will grant that humanists are correct, that religion can be harmful and violent though not as they think, because of some deep and systemic flaw in religion as such, but rather because when religion is violent, it proceeds from a debased understanding of God and man. Let me repeat that. When, <clears throat> when religion is violent, it proceeds from a debased understanding of God and humanity. In the concluding part of my lecture, I will argue against the new atheist that there are rational grounds for theism and that those grounds are to be found in human experience if fully appreciated for what it is and in the very ideals that humanism claims to champion. How am I doing so far? All right? Filled with renewed confidence, I shall carry on. <clears throat> The ethical case against religion is summed up concisely enough by Sam Harris, who says that religion is the most prolific source of violence in our history, and that faith is the mother of hatred wherever people define their moral identities in religious terms. These are extravagant claims. Secular humanists like Harris are mistaken in thinking that religion by its very nature promotes violence but there is a type of religious outlook that does, and humanists are, of course, right to deplore it. Religion is a huge category of human experience. To say that someone is religious tells us very little about her particular beliefs or the ways they relate to her life. One very broad definition of religion is that it refers to the ways that human beings seek meaning by relating their life to a greater, perhaps transcendent, whole. In his classic study, The Varieties of Religious Experience, William James gave a famous definition. Religion, he says, consists of the belief that there is an unseen order and that our supreme good lies in harmoniously adjusting ourselves thereto. Some religions are theistic, some are not. What a religion says about human beings is at least as important as what it says about the divine. Religion can be humanistic or anti-humanistic, by which I mean it can either promote respect for human dignity or undermine it. And that's how, in the context of religious history and thought, I will use those two terms, humanistic and anti-humanistic. It might well be that there is no more important criterion in religion and no more important criterion for deciding which religious ideas or beliefs to accept and which ones to reject. First, let's look at the basic structure of humanistic forms of religion 
than at the basic structure of the anti-humanistic forms. The first point to be made is that the world's religions are an incomparably rich source of reflection about human value, worth, and dignity. In fact, for most of its history, until the Enlightenment, the idea of human dignity was a religious idea. It was formulated and expressed in religious terms and language. The first book of the Hebrew Bible contains a seminal formulation of human dignity. Genesis 1.26, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. The Jewish writers so esteemed human worth that they compared it with God. That esteem was one of the sources of their very idea of God, one of the foundations of their faith. The human and the divine were two aspects of one reality. Genesis 1.26 expresses an idea common to other religions that emerged during what the German philosopher Karl Jaspers called the Axial Age, the middle several, several hundred years of the first millennium BCE, from about 700 to 200 BCE. That common idea is simple and powerful. The sacredness of human life, a, sacred, a sacredness recognized more from within than revealed from on high. In Hinduism, it is expressed in the doctrine of Atman or the soul, the indwelling of the divine of Brahman that makes every human being a person. Moksha, salvation or full union with Brahman, is to be achieved through fulfilling the inner moral law or Dharma. In Confucianism, heaven or Tian is not a transcendent state of salvation, but the moral order that permeates the cosmos. Human beings are capable of aligning themselves with this imminent moral order by cultivating the uh, supreme Confucian virtue of Ren, perhaps best translated simply as humanity. Ren is an achieved state, an achieved quality, and on that ground, on the ground of our capacity for becoming ever more fully human, the Confucian philosopher Mientius declared boldly that the human individual is of infinite value. So, ide ideas like these are the fundamental foundational moments in the humanistic tradition in religion or in religious humanism. According to this tradition, the divine, whatever it may be in itself, is for us an ideal motivating our efforts to become ever more worthy of it, to approximate it ever more closely, to realize it ever more fully in ourselves and in the world. As Jesus put it simply in Matthew 5.48, be perfect even as your Father in heaven is perfect. I couldn't resist. <laughs> no doubt Jesus looked just like that Portuguese actor dude. <clears throat> In religious humanism, human dignity involves a dual capacity. First, for recognizing the ideal or the divine image, and second, for perfectibility or moral improvement according to it. As some of you know, I like to refer to this distinctive human capacity as ideal self-determination. In the Christian patristic period, that is in the first several centuries of the Common Era, the Church Fathers, perhaps especially in the Byzantine East, laid the foundations for this type of powerful theological interpretation of Genesis 1.26. Human beings are created in God's image but we must assimilate to God's likeness by our own efforts. As we will see, Renaissance religious humanists further developed this type of image and likeness theology in their defense of human dignity. Christianity is a humanistic type of religion in another basic way. Its defining doctrine 
is the incarnation of the divine in the human, which means that the human is worthy of embodying the divine. And the reverse is true as well. God became human so that humans might become divine. This doctrine of salvation as divinization or theosis was taught by Athanasius of Alexandria and other church fathers. The profound humanism of Christianity was affirmed in the most striking way at the church council held in Chalcedon in the year 451. The council's main concern was Christology. It confirmed the two natures of Christ, divine and human, which abide in him in perfect harmony without division or confusion to use the Chalcedonian formula. It is hard to imagine a more powerful vindication of human worth. The humanity of Christ was preserved even alongside his divinity. What about the youngest Abrahamic religion, Islam? The idea that human, that human beings are created in the image of God does not find a particularly strong echo in the Quran, but it does resonate in Islamic mysticism or Sufism. The great Sufi philosopher Ibn al-Arabi taught that divinity and, hum and humanity are two aspects of one divine reality, and that each person is a unique, precious epiphany of the hidden God. His approach to faith was tolerant, pluralistic, and ecumenical. His advice on this point has been quoted often. Do not attach yourself to any particular creed exclusively so that you may disbelieve all the rest. Otherwise, you will lose much good. Nay, you will fail to recognize the real truth of the matter. God is not limited by any one creed. For, and here he quotes the Quran, wheresoever ye turn, there is the face of Allah. Earlier I referred to the basic structure of religious humanism. We can now see its essential elements. Let me highlight three. First and foremost is the idea of the sacredness of the human person or of human dignity. That idea entails that human beings, while essentially related to the divine, are not wholly dependent on it, that we have free will and autonomy. <clears throat> Religious humanism maintains that while we are created in or otherwise carry the divine image, it is our responsibility to achieve through our own efforts an ever greater likeness to the divine ideal. The second element of religious humanism is its distinctive approach to salvation. The basic meaning of salvation is deliverance or release from death, suffering, and evil, and more generally from the contingency, finitude, and imperfection of the natural world. In Christianity and other but not all religions, salvation is associated with blessed eternal life in God. A fundamental issue especially in Christianity, <clears throat> is whether salvation takes place with or without human participation and cooperation, whether human beings are capable of working toward salvation, whether they must earn the grace that ultimately saves, or as the German philosopher Immanuel Kant once put it, the grace that makes up the deficit for what we cannot accomplish after we have done our best. The approach that emphasizes human participation, the efficacy of human work, and progress toward salvation is often called perfectibility. Not in the sense that human beings can perfect themselves on their own, but that we can and ought to strive to realize, as much as humanly possible, the good. The New Testament basis for uh, perfectibility is Matthew 5.48, which I quoted earlier. Be perfect even as your Father in heaven is perfect. That's the focal point of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus' teaching about the path to the kingdom of God. So, in religious humanism, 
salvation is conceived as a joint divine human project. We need to take responsibility for our, for our salvation and actively work toward it, rather than resigning ourselves to an exaggerated sense of a weak and sinful human nature as an excuse to do nothing but to await salvation as an external gift. There is a beautiful statement of this activist approach in Buddhism. Be lamps unto yourselves, the Buddha taught. Betake yourselves to no external refuge. Hold fast as a refuge to the truth. Work out your own salvation with diligence. The third element of religious humanism is religious pluralism, as Ibn al-Arabi taught. No religion can legitimately claim to be the only way to God, but each is legitimate in its own way, or at least can be. So, that's an overview of the humanistic tradition in religion. Now let's turn to religious anti-humanism. Even as some writers of the Hebrew Bible were affirming that human beings are created in the image and likeness of God, others, perhaps a century earlier, in the book of Deuteronomy, were declaring that the Israelites were God's chosen people and that God commands them to wage violence, war, and even genocide on those who are not chosen and who worship other gods. Of this, Karen Armstrong writes, like any human idea, the notion of God can be exploited and abused. The myth of a chosen people and a divine election has often inspired a narrow tribal theology from the time of the Deuteronomist right up to the Jewish, Christian, and Muslim fundamentalism that is unhappily rife in our own day. The point can be put more strongly. If the notion of divine election is taken to mean that some people are chosen or saved solely on the basis of their religious affiliation, while others are damned on that basis, then the notion is the religious equivalent of racism, sexism, and other dehumanizing ideologies, ideologies which are often found together. Furthermore, in the same way that racism and sexism are prone to violence, so too is religious fundamentalism. There is another related but distinct root of religious anti-humanism. It is the view that human beings are so debilitated by sin that we have no autonomous capacity for the good or for moral progress. This is the Christian doctrine of original sin, of humanity's fallen nature and depravity. It can be traced to St. Augustine, the most influential figure in Western Christianity after Jesus and St. Paul. Augustine converted in the year 386 at the age of 31. He described his conversion in his autobiographical Confessions, one of the great works of Christian literature. In 391, he was ordained a priest in North Africa. Four years later, he was appointed bishop there, a position he held until his death in 430. His theological masterpieces include On the Trinity and the City of God. Augustine developed his theology of sin and salvation in his controversy with the British monk Pelagius. This was one of the great theological struggles in church history. Pelagius defended free will, the human capacity for good, and the activist, perfectibilist position on salvation that I described a moment ago. Augustine, by contrast, had a very dark view of human nature, which he thought was hopelessly corrupted by an overwhelming inclination for evil. Original sin, he said, has turned humanity into a mass of perdition from which no one can free himself because the will is held in bondage to sin. He, Augustine, repeatedly uses the term lump to describe humanity in its state of loss as in his terrible phrase, 
the damned lump of humanity. Left to our own devices, we are doomed. For Augustine, salvation thus largely meant salvation from ourselves through the external unilateral action of unmerited grace. Another part is, of his fatalistic theory was predestination. While everyone deserves to be damned, through God's mercy, some have already been saved. Whatever earthly good the elect do is a result of grace, not human effort, which is ineffectual. This dispute between Augustine and Pelagius had momentous consequences. Augustine's anti-humanism prevailed over Pelagius's humanism. In fact, Augustine succeeded in having Pelagianism condemned as a heresy at the church synod that was held at Carthage in the year 418. To understand Augustine and the medieval church, it is important to understand the notion of heresy. Let me provide a little historical context. By the 5th century, the 400s, Christianity had become the state religion of the Roman Empire. <clears throat> the church was an increasingly powerful institution, which was not a bad thing given that the Western Empire was collapsing under the Germanic invasions. A strong and independent church could help preserve some semblance of civilization. It could also use its power to enforce what it determined to be theological truth or orthodoxy. An early example of orthodoxy was the Nicene Creed from the year 325. Heresy was defined in opposition to orthodoxy and the church had already begun suppressing it. The persecution of heresy depended in the words of one 20th century scholar on the conviction that there is an ascertained body of religious truth which must be believed in order to attain salvation. The church was regarded as the sole custodian of this body of truth. That meant, of course, that outside the church there was no salvation. Extra ecclesium nulla salus. This view went well with Augustine's idea of original sin, but not so well with his idea of predestination. For if the fate of every human soul has been decided in advance, how could the church, or anything for that matter, affect the outcome? But Augustine did not let this deter him. He argued that heretics and enemies of the church did threaten salvation, and therefore it was legitimate to use force, state power, against them, though he didn't think that heretics should be killed. To his credit, he was opposed in principle to the death penalty. In a letter to some heretics, as he regarded them, he wrote, nothing can cause more complete death to the soul than the freedom to disseminate error. Princeton University's Peter Brown, one of the great authorities on Augustine, has written that for all his personal moderation and sincerity, nonetheless, in his justification of the persecution of heresy, there lurked something fallacious, horrible, and insidious. It is difficult to avoid the conclusion that the church father helped lay the ideological foundations for centuries of violence meted out against heretics, religious dissenters, and non-Christians, a record that left a terrible stain not only on the Catholic Church, but also on Protestantism, since Martin Luther and John Calvin were fervent Augustinians. In their case against religion, today's humanist and new atheists are able to point to this record, and they do, sometimes it seems, with glee. There is no point in belaboring the details, but here are the main episodes. The church established the medieval inquisition as an institution in 1231 and put the Dominicans in charge. The punishment for heretics who refused to recant was death carried out by secular authorities. Often it took the dreadful form of being burned alive. Perhaps 2,000 people died in the medieval inquisition. In 1478, the Spanish inquisition was established. The first inquisitor general or grand inquisitor 
was the Dominican friar Tomas de Torquemada, who directed the, br the brutal persecution and mass expulsion of Jews and Muslims. He condemned perhaps 2,000 people to death by burning. Apart from the persecution of heresy in the strict sense, there were other related forms of religious violence in the medieval and early modern periods. In 1095, the first of numerous crusades was launched. They were directed not only against the Holy Land, but also against popular heresies in Europe, such as the Cathars or Albigensians and the Hussites. The victims of the Crusades numbered at least a million, 20,000 in the Albigensian Crusade alone. Over the centuries, both in and apart from the Crusades, Jews were massacred in frightful numbers. Just as the Reconquista was completed in Spain, Columbus and the Conquistadors took the crusading spirit to the New World, where they massacred native peoples in the name of Christ. Back in Europe, witch hunts started in earnest in the 1500s. Perhaps 50,000 people, mostly women, perished. By then, Europe was tearing itself apart in the so-called wars of religion, though religion was only one factor. Many millions died in these wars, mainly in the century before 1648. It would be simple-minded to reduce these complex events spanning more than half a millennium to a single cause such as Augustinian anti-humanism. Nonetheless, they do, in varying degrees, bear some relation to the idea that since salvation depended not on individual moral effort, but on correct belief as determined by the church, then the church's alleged enemies, heretics, other dissenters, Jews, Muslims, and women demonized as witches, all had to be defeated. Even if it was seldom the only cause of violence, this view could provide theological justification for persecution and violence done for the usual sordid human reasons. Violence comes from having unlimited power over others, and the pretended power to mediate salvation is a very great power indeed. The medieval church claimed that power. In the Reformation, the number of Christian churches went from one to many, with most of them committed to their own version of Outside the church, there is no salvation, nor is there any apart from correct belief. This process, known as confessionalization, predictably escalated the level of violence. Augustinian anti-humanism had a deep impact on medieval and early modern Christianity. However, Christian humanism was never extinguished. All along, it had been preserved in the order of St. Benedict and St. Scholastica. Benedictine monasteries were the centers of learning and scholarship in medieval Christendom. In fact, as the Oxford church historian, Diarmaid McCulloch, recently put it, the survival of European civilization would have been inconceivable without monasteries and nunneries. Thank you, sisters. The Benedictines cultivated classical learning and the liberal arts. In their monastic scriptoria, they collected, preserved, and copied ancient and classical manuscripts, which otherwise would have been lost to civilization. Their, world made, their work made possible the further development of humanism in the Renaissance. It is fitting that the first Renaissance treatise on human dignity was written with the encouragement and help of a Benedictine monk, Antonio de Barga. Uh, that's the excellence and outstanding character of humanity. The Renaissance began in Italy in the 14th century and was centered in Florence. Humanism was its most important intellectual movement. As we have seen, the term humanism was devised early in the 19th century, 1808 to be precise, and it was applied retrospectively to the Renaissance to designate the study of the humanities. 
The term humanist was used in the Renaissance in Latin and in vernacular languages to refer to a teacher or student of the humanities. Humanistic study was based on classical languages and literature, Greek and especially Latin. The first great humanist were Francesco Petrarch and Giovanni Boccaccio. They and their followers admired the culture of classical antiquity and hoped to bring about its rebirth or renaissance. Petrarch's favorite writer was Cicero, who gave the humanist their ideal, humanitas. Cicero used this term to translate another, paideia, the Greek word for education and culture. By humanitas, he wanted to convey the idea that humanity is not something given except as a potential. It is rather a quality to be achieved and cultivated through education and culture. Thus, the highest purpose of humanistic study is the fullest realization of one's humanity. That's the meaning of Renaissance humanism. It was both classical and Christian. From Petrarch on, one of the main themes of Renaissance humanism was human dignity. Here as well, the humanist learned from Cicero. In his seminal text on duties, he uses the term dignitas and identifies its source as reason, which he says is the first common possession of man and God. The humanist also closely studied the Stoics, who taught that reason is a portion of the divine in every person. After Fascio's Benedictine-inspired treatise on human dignity, the next work on the theme was written by Gionazzo Manetti, the, Florin, uh, the Florentine ambassador to Naples. It was a response to Pope Innocent, III, uh, Pope Innocent III's perfectly Augustinian on the misery of human life. For some, Innocent III was not so innocent. In 1200, he launched the Albigensian Crusade, and in 1204, the Fourth Crusade. In the second half of the 15th century, the defense of human dignity was taken up by a circle of Renaissance Platonic philosophers led by Marsilio Ficino. The circle is known as the Florentine Academy, though it was rather informal. In 1482, Ficino published his masterpiece, Platonic theology. The book's main idea is the divinity and immortality of the human soul, which Ficino saw in its infinite ideal aspirations. They constitute the soul's likeness to God, which human beings, as rational, free, and moral agents, are responsible for progressively realizing. The transcendent culmination of this process of human perfectibility is divinization or theosis, a concept Ficino and other Renaissance philosophers borrowed from the church fathers. The idea that human dignity consists in our capacity for perfectibility or for assimilation to the divine likeness was characteristic of Renaissance humanism. Thus, contrary to anachronistic secularizing interpretations, Renaissance humanism was in fact a profound religious humanism. As the historian Charles Trinkhaus showed in a classic study, in our image and likeness, humanity and divinity in Italian humanist thought. The religious nature of Renaissance humanism is also clear in the thought of one of its best known figures, the young Florentine prince, Giovanni Pico, uh, Pico della Mirandola. In 1486, he wrote an oration which later editors entitled On Human Dignity. It is often regarded as the manifesto of the Italian Renaissance. Pico recounts how God, ma how God made man a creature of indeterminate nature and said to him this,
1942, the German philosopher Ernst Cassirer wrote in a seminal essay on Picot that this idea of man as a free maker and molder of himself with the power to ascend to divine heights meant that the likeness to God is, quote, not a gift bestowed on man to begin with, but an achievement for him to work out. Through freedom, human beings are not only related to God, but, Kassir says, actually one with him. For human freedom is of such a kind that any increase in its meaning or value is impossible. Thus, this is still Kassir, when, uh, when Picot ascribes to man an independent and innate creative power, he has, in this one fundamental respect, made man equal to divinity. This is a particularly striking way of expressing Picot's idea, which he shared with Ficino, that the source of human dignity is the wondrous capacity for self-determination and perfectibility. Pacino, Picot, and other Renaissance humanists were convinced that faith and reason were compatible. At the beginning of his oration, Picot refers to man as a great miracle. This was no mere rhetorical flourish. Human freedom and creativity, the ability to pose ideals and realize them, transforming ourselves and the world, were for Picot the grounds not only of human dignity, but also of faith in divine reality. For the humanist, the very presence of the free creative human spirit in the physical world implied God's existence. Keep that thought in mind. It provides a clue as to how we might deal with the epistemic argument against God that I referred to at the beginning of this lecture. Here's a related point. Since the, since the Renaissance humanists premised their approach to faith on human autonomy and dignity, it logically excluded coercion. From, from Italy, humanism spread to northern Europe. The best known figures are Desiderius Erasmus of Rotterdam in the Netherlands, and the Englishman, Sir Thomas More. I will confine my few remarks to Erasmus, who is often regarded as the preeminent humanist scholar of the Renaissance. He was the first international scholarly celebrity, a fame made possible by the new printing press. His published works, such as Praise of Folly, were bestsellers. Most important was his annotated edition of the Greek New Testament, with a parallel New Latin translation, tacitly intended to supersede St. Jerome's centuries-old version known as the Vulgate. He hoped that his edition would further, in his words, the restoration and rebuilding of the Christian religion. The term he generally used for his Christian humanism was philosophia Christi, or the philosophy and wisdom of Christ, as presented in the Gospels. His humanist optimism was the direct antithesis of Augustinian pessimism. According to Professor McCulloch, Erasmus had too much respect for human creativity and dignity to accept Augustine's premise that the human mind had been utterly corrupted in the fall. Instead, this is still McCulloch, he preferred, he preferred Erasmus preferred, that other giant of the early church's theology, the great counterpoint to Augustine across the centuries, origin of Alexandria. Erasmus himself wrote that, quote, a single page of origin teaches me more Christian philosophy than 10 of Augustine. In 1517, Erasmus expressed the hope that Christendom was entering a new golden age of peace, justice, and piety. It was not to be. That year marked the beginning of the Protestant Reformation. After another 150 years of religious strife and violence, European Christians finally started to realize that they should stop killing at least each other over their religious differences. 
Initially, this realization took the form of mere toleration or forbearance from religious persecution in the interest of civil peace and order. But by early in the European Enlightenment, by about the year 1700, toleration had developed into something different, the positive concept of freedom of conscience. In 1689, the English political philosopher John Locke published his letter concerning toleration. In it, he wrote that the care of each man's salvation belongs only to himself and rests on genuine faith, which can, be a matter, which can only be a matter of inward conviction, not external compulsion. Though he called it toleration, it was already very close to the positive right of freedom of conscience. The recognition that religious belief is a matter of individual conscience and cannot be externally coerced. Freedom of conscience is the first and most basic natural or human right, as Locke seems to have understood, because it goes to the very core of human dignity. That core is the capacity for self-determination and perfectibility according to inwardly and freely recognized ideals. Now, as we have seen, Religious humanists all along had revered this capacity for ideal self-determination, describing it as our likeness to God. The modern concept of freedom of conscience at last recognized it, ideal self-determination, as a natural right. To put this another way, with freedom of conscience, religious humanism became the law of the land, and at least in principle, triumphed over religious anti-humanism. Recognition of freedom of conscience was a major historical threshold. It was the beginning of liberalism, or of constitutional government and the rule of law, based on respect for human dignity and natural or human rights. Humanists today champion liberalism and human rights often without recognizing that religious humanism, as I have presented it this evening, forms their long prehistory. Liberalism did not emerge in opposition to religion, as many humanists today think, but only in opposition to one of its forms. And it grew organically out of another form in which it has very deep roots. So, by this point, I think any fair-minded humanist would have to concede that religion is a very big category, that it includes not only anti-humanist but also humanist forms, and that the historical tradition of religious humanism deepened and advanced the most important thing of all, human dignity. By the last third of the 19th century, the religious roots of humanism had been largely severed. At the beginning of my lecture, I referred to Marx's identification of humanism with naturalism or atheism. There were also more openly hideous forms of atheism, such as social Darwinism and the new so-called scientific racism, which culminated in Nazism. Modern forms of religious fundamentalism emerged in response to atheism, though in some important respects, they are its mirror image. Together, all these anti-humanistic ideologies, including those like communism that called themselves humanism, all these ideologies made the 20th century the most murderous one in human history. And with that tragic but necessary recognition, let me turn to the concluding part of my lecture. Several times this evening, I have described the image of God as the ideal in ideal self-determination. But is the image of God real, or more precisely, is God reflected in the image real? That's the question at stake in what I referred to at the outset as the epistemic case against belief in God advanced by the new atheists who claim that there are no rational grounds for theism. 
I will deal briefly with that argument now. I will begin with Kant's approach to the rationality of theism. I promise it will be short. The idea that human dignity consists in the capacity for ideal self-determination is a Kantian argument. Kant preferred the term autonomy to ideal self-determination, but his argument that it is the source of human dignity has been vastly influential ever since he advanced it in 1785. For Kant, the ideal that drives our self-determination toward it is not directly the image of God, but rather what Kant calls the moral law. Now right away that is confusing because law implies something externally imposed while self-determination has to come from within. But in fact, Kant's moral law is a pure intrinsic ideal of reason, so we're still good. But in fact, <clears throat> uh, it functions just like the image of God. Essentially, the moral law is given inwardly by conscience. Now, the upshot is that Kant thinks that the capacity for ideal self-determination or autonomy is not only the source of human dignity, but that it is also a rational basis for belief in God because it cannot, in principle, be reduced to naturalistic explanation. It is a type of ideal causation that overrides natural causation. Therefore, it has metaphysical or theistic implications. So, already we have found rational grounds for theism, and we have found them in human nature itself, which is why Picot, as you'll remember, called human beings a great miracle. The new atheists take a much different approach to the problem of the rationality of theism. They understand the word God to mean a being who created the universe. Proceeding from that understanding, they then correctly state that there is no convincing scientific evidence for such a being, and that, moreover, such a being itself would require scientific explanation. But in this, they have fundamentally misunderstood the concept of God. Theism, if philosophically formulated, does not maintain that God is a being, but rather that God is the necessary ground or source of being and in that sense, the creator. Theists also use the terms necessary being, infinite being, eternal being, but in wholly different senses than a being. The new atheists seem not to understand this idea of God. They write long books attacking straw men. The theistic concept of God rests on the distinction between contingent and necessary existence. This is important, but again, it will not take long. The natural universe in space and time is contingent, which means that it exists, but not necessarily. Nothing in or about it entails or requires its existence. One can easily imagine its non-existence. In fact, its contingency is the most basic and striking fact about the universe taken on its own. The Big Bang does not affect this fact, nor does any conceivable natural origin of the universe. Even if the universe has always existed, as the now generally discredited steady state theory maintained, still it would be contingent. The fact that the universe does exist but that obviously its existence does not come from itself, or in other words, is not its essence. This fact entails, in the strict sense of entails, a transcendent ground of being, necessary being, God. 
This is the cosmological proof in roughly the version presented by St. Thomas Aquinas in the third of his five ways demonstrating God's existence. Though it is referred to as an argument or proof, it might also be called the cosmological or metaphysical experience because it follows from human experience of the contingency of existence. The great creation myths are rooted in this experience. It is expressed in Leibniz's famous question, why is there something rather than nothing? Though the cosmological experience is a basic human experience, not everyone opens him or herself to it, especially in recent times. If the new atheist had had this type of experience, they would have written very different books. The cosmological or metaphysical experience is one indication that it is the very nature of human consciousness to transcend the empirical world. It does so by ideals such as truth, virtue, beauty, justice, the good, the infinite, and the absolute. These ideals are intrinsic to reason, yet their reality cannot be empirically demonstrated. That is their very nature as ideals, which is why they belong to both faith and reason. They coalesce in one supreme ideal, the image of God. Earlier in my lecture, I remarked that recognition of the sacred value of human persons was itself a source of Genesis 126. This ancient Judaic insight has often been rediscovered anew, once, for example, in the perhaps unlikely context of the early 20th century philosophical method known as phenomenology. I'll now spend the next hour describing that for you. <clears throat> I won't. Um, but in Weimar, Germany, after the First World War, there was a brilliant young phenomenologist struggling for an academic career. Edith Stein was born in 1891 on Yom Kippur into an observant Jewish family. In 1917, she defended with great distinction her doctoral dissertation on the problem of empathy. She converted to Catholicism in 1922, began teaching at St. Magdalene College for women in the town of Speyer, Germany, lived with the Dominican sisters there, and pursued scholarship as service to God, as she put it. In 1933, when Hitler took power, she sent a letter to Pope Pius XI asking him to denounce the regime, referring to herself as, quote, a child of the Jewish people who, by the grace of God, for the past 11 years has also been a child of the Catholic Church. She wrote the Pope that responsibility for the Nazis must fall after all, on those who brought them to this point, and it also falls on those who keep silent. Later that year, she became a Carmelite sister, taking the religious name Teresa Benedicta of the Cross. In 1936, she completed one of her most important books, Finite and Eternal Being. On New Year's Eve, 1938, after the Kristallnacht pogrom against German Jews, the Carmelites transferred Sister Teresa Benedicta to one of their monasteries in the Netherlands to, to help her escape the Nazis, ultimately to no avail. In August 1942, she and her sister Rosa, also serving with the Carmelites, were deported to Auschwitz and killed. Stein left a very rich spiritual and philosophical legacy, her collected works comprising many volumes. In 1998, she was canonized by Pope John Paul II. In Nazi Germany and in the occupied Netherlands, she witnessed human beings at their worst. She confronted in its starkest form what philosophers call the problem of evil. It must have been an extraordinary faith, both in God and in humanity, that enabled her throughout these years to maintain that Christ was still, as she said, the ideal of human perfection 
and that we hold the image of the Lord continually before our eyes in order to make ourselves like him. As we look forward to Easter, could there be a more powerful testimony to the true meaning of humanism? Thank you. Please. Hello. Hello. <laughs> um, okay, so my question is based off of the point that you made about how the 20th century was the most murderous century in the uh, religious history. And so my question was based on that, uh, the religious um, and the government groups such as the Nazis and other socialist, fascist, and communist groups, where is the line between a government that is humanist in its protection of its people and where it becomes anti-humanist in its treatment of others? Excellent. Um, what a wonderful question. Um, what is the criterion that we use, if I understand your question correctly, um, in distinguishing between humanistic and anti-humanistic governments, right? That, that governments draw on a wide range of ideas through which they govern. So what is the criterion that, 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 that one can use? I would, I would suggest that, that it's liberalism, that, it's, uh, that, it, that it is the idea that government power, state power, must be limited by the idea that every individual person is sacred, is uh, an end in itself, can never be treated as a means, uh, and all of the human rights that flow um, from, that, from that idea. If, if that is dispensed with, the idea that there is an absolute value, and that that absolute value is the person, and one can maintain various ideas about the source of that value. I've suggested that it's ideal self-determination and that that idea entails theism. But you don't need to go there. I mean, you, can, you can maintain an agnostic perspective that the source is, is ideal self-determination, but let's leave it there. Uh, we don't know enough about the metaphysical or theistic implications. Uh, but I do think that without that absolute, uh, without human dignity and human rights, then it is a very, very slippery slope to the hell on earth that was the 20th century. Even governments that suggest that they're actually working uh, for human betterment, and that might require just that we sacrifice a few uh, for the happiness of the many, uh, it's a very slippery slope. So the criterion, I think. Uh, is in short, human dignity and human rights. Thank you. As we know, religion isn't going anywhere today. In fact, most people want more religion in their daily lives. Would you say that's correct? Um. Mm, I, I agree with you that the so-called secularization thesis um, has not had the explanatory power that social scientists thought it might have in the 1970s. Well, my thought is that about humanism um, helps bring out the more benevolent practices of faith and helps condemn the more malevolent and even violent practices, such as feminism and LGBT rights were at first secular ideologies, but are now being integrated into faith-based traditions. Uh, I, think that, I think humanism has a lot to help with that. I agree, um, and, and I think that, that, I mean, one of the, I think perhaps the, uh, the most, if not the most important point, one of the most important points that I, that I wanted to make this evening is that I'm actually meeting uh, the humanist uh, more than halfway. In fact, I'm adopting the humanist criterion as the criterion 
by which we should evaluate religions, by which uh, we should accept or reject uh, various religious beliefs or, um, or, or practices. So I fully agree with you that there is a, there is a, a, a wide range of opportunity for a meeting of humanists uh, and uh, religious folk. I suppose my question would be, I feel, I suppose my question would be, I think hum, humanism's role is to help bring out the benevolent practices of religion and condemn the malevolent practices since religion isn't going anywhere. And that's, it's not, it's, so. That's beautifully put. That's lovely. That's very, okay. very nice. That humanism, the role of humanism is to bring out the benevolent practices of religion and to condemn the, the malevolent ones. Beautiful, very nice. <clears throat> I was wondering what caused the change in mindset around the 1700s um, that started promoting the freedom of conscience from the previous mindset that any belief other than the church wasn't tolerated. Oh, good. Yeah, that's, um, that's a very intelligent question. What, what was responsible for this intellectual shift uh, from essentially extra ecclesium nulla salus? There is no salvation apart from the church uh, or apart from correct belief. What, what, what transformed uh, that outlook uh, to freedom, freedom of conscience, uh, the, the, the realization, the acceptance that religious humanism is normative. Um, one, of the, one, of the, one of the major contributing factors was there was a large increase in the amount of religious violence in early modern times. So, Based on what I was saying here, the, 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 the violence during the medieval era was terror. It was terrible, but it was a fraction of what it became uh, during the early modern period when increasingly powerful states uh, undergoing the sorts of transformations in early modern Europe that would produce uh, the enormously powerful states of today. That was beginning in the early modern period and they were able to, these, uh, these increasingly powerful states were able to draw uh, on various religious ideas. And the result of that was the era of Europe's religious wars. So take, for example, the Thirty Years' War between 1618 and 1648, the bloodiest war in European history prior to the 20th century. Um, so this combination of increasingly powerful states and the old medieval mentality meant that uh, Europe was bleeding itself to death. Uh, and that first, through expediency, through necessity, required an end to the religious violence. So the first step was religious toleration. Uh, and then the second step was freedom of conscience. And Enlightenment ideas of natural and, and human rights were able to draw on the whole preceding history back to ancient times of the idea of human dignity. So the, the threshold, I think, involved two distinct factors. Uh, the reality of uh, a much increased level of violence that needed to end. And secondly, uh, the uh, intellectual power of enlightenment minds um, that were able to crystallize um, the whole preceding history of human dignity into the idea of what we now call human rights. Um, it is a crucial threshold in, in modern history, the, 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 the very threshold that you spoke to. Um, and so you were, you were right to single that out uh, as needing additional explanation. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, hey. Oh. Hey. Uh, you've been talking a lot about freedom of conscience. Um, do you think romanticism in the Renaissance sprung out of this same idea of humanism in the Renaissance? And what do the two have to do with each other? 
Wow. Um, did the Renaissance and did early 19th century Romanticism spring from the same idea of humanism? Spring from the same idea of humanism. There were, uh, there were important, the, the, the Renaissance and Romanticism uh, shared important ideas. Uh, both were broadly religious, so already at that level. Uh, it's the humanism of Romanticism and the humanism of the, Rena of the Renaissance uh, shared the similarity of being both um, religious uh, humanisms. But Romanticism was a reaction against uh, Enlightenment universalism. So, there's, so there's, a, there's a huge development, a huge intellectual development uh, between the Renaissance and Romanticism, namely the Enlightenment that shaped the whole character of Romanticism. Um, so I would, I would be cautious about, about suggesting that, that uh, romantic humanism has a lot in common with, with uh, uh, Renaissance humanism. I would rather stress, I would rather stress uh, the differences. And there, and there was a particular current in, uh, in Romanticism um, starts out innocently enough um, which is the idea that abstract reason is limited and in fact um, we know what we know through various communities of human people. That's a, that's a perfectly uh, productive and true idea. Uh, but from that idea there emerged um, more threatening ideas of, of nationalism, the reduction of the individual to the community, uh, so the, the idea that the value of the person is the community rather than the, rather than the idea that, um, that uh, the community is an indispensable value for self-realization. Um, so it's, there's, so, there's so much happens in between the Renaissance and Romanticism. Um, that, that um, I think the differences are, are more striking than Definitely. the similarities. Thank you. Thank you. Jennifer, hello. Hello, how are you? Good. <laughs> so I have a question for you then. Um, is theism really necessary for humanism to thrive? I mean, because we don't need religion for morality. So I'm just wondering, I mean, what, what is your opinion on Good. that? Um, that's, a, that's a very important question. Uh, Jennifer, we don't need religion for morality. I agree with you, we don't. Um, morality is a human capacity. It's the capacity to recognize ideals uh, and to determine yourself according to those ideals. So human rights, for example, uh, like in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, uh, the, the Declaration is silent about religion. Uh, I, I think that it is right uh, to ground morality and human dignity itself in human sources. Uh, and then to open up the possibility that those human sources, morality itself, the capacity for ideal self-determination, lead to uh, theistic conclusions. But you don't have to go there. Um, I do, but you don't have to. Um, agnosticism is an intellectually credible position. Um, so I, uh, I agree with you, Jen, that, that, um, that humanism doesn't need religion, morality doesn't need religion, uh, but I probably differ with you in suggesting that it takes us there. It doesn't need it, but it takes us there. Right, thank okay. you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Poole. That was a very stimulating talk. Um, I just have a question regarding your understanding of human dignity as self 
self-realization mm -hmm. um, and even the capacity of, uh, to self-realization. What about somebody who finds himself in a position where they are no longer able to realize themselves? Um, and I think of Anita Stein in a horrible concentration camp or somebody who might suffer from Alzheimer's, for example. Mm -hmm. Does that person then no longer have human dignity? <laughs> I had to ask it. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's good. It's good. <laughs> let, me, let me start this way. Um, first, thank you very much for that important question, Kevin. Um, first attempt is this. Um, that it is the potential for autonomy um, that is the ground of human dignity, uh, or the potential for ideal self-realization. Uh, infants, for example, um, are not yet capable of ideal self-realization, but clearly they have the potential, right? Um, so I revise uh, Kant's understanding in that way, um, that it is that, that it's not autonomy or, or ideal self-determination that is the source of dignity, it is the potential um, for both. Now, in the case of, in the case of Edith Stein in, in, uh, in the Nazi camps, uh, she, she was still capable, and I have no doubt that she was, that she was still pursuing uh, ideal self-determination, perhaps even more powerfully than at any other time in her life, uh, until the moment she was killed. Um, so so self-realization uh, doesn't just depend on, on the external circumstances that we, that we think of for human flourishing. It's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's an inner capacity. Uh, that can be that can be pursued even under deplorable uh, external circumstances. Uh, a somewhat different question. A somewhat different question is uh, someone who who is uh, losing all of his or her uh, uh, higher intellectual capacities through some debilitating uh, disease. In that case, I would say that that uh, that the person still has human dignity, and we should respect him or her as a person because uh, he or she um, had that capacity until that affliction. Um, the most difficult case uh, is the following one. Um, a, say, let's, let's, it's just a hypothetical uh, possibility, I don't know that science uh, can now or will ever be able to make this determination, uh, but let's you know let's say that that uh, a person has suffered a tragic, uh, horribly debilitating uh, car accident, um, and science determines that the person is totally uh, brain dead with no chance. Um, of recovery. Uh, in that case, it might be technically possible um, to suggest that, um, that this is a human being um, who is no longer but once was um, a person. But I don't know that that's, that medicine can make that determination now or ever or ever could, and of course, prior to that tragic accident, um, the, uh, the, the 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 there was a full there was a full uh, person. So that's a, I mean for you know for for conceptual distinctions that that particular example uh, might be might be uh, illustrative, um, but. Uh, it's uncomfortable. Thank you. Yes. I will. And this will be the last one. Sure. And then uh, after this question and after your brilliant response, we'll all go out to the foyer and you can have unilateral uh, discussions with Professor Poole and maybe eat a cookie or have something to drink. So one more question. Sure. Hi, Hi. Doctor. 
Um, this is the second uh, presentation where I've been, uh, where I've heard that uh, the, these newer atheists uh, uh, don't understand the, um, you know, the gods that are present in the people's lives today. Uh, be, and then we go through this history of how theologians and thinkers have finally gotten do, God down to, uh, or God in, um, how did you say it, from God's become more, less of a presence and more of an essence, I guess you could say. Is that, was that part of it? Oh, you, you didn't say it like that? Well, where was the word essence used anyway? Uh, uh, that, was, that was in my review of the, of the cosmological proof. The idea, the idea is that while the universe exists, existence is not its essence. Um, so okay. that its, its okay. existence is contingent. But, you know, and that, by the way, um, is proof. Okay, well, I didn't know the word essence was used to prove existence in any way, but what I've seen is a diminution of, of what God is in the intellectual world and the theologian's world, uh, and then people point to that, those more... Uh, less personal, less present types of thinking of God. Mm -hmm. And they point to that as why atheists don't understand what God is. What, what atheists, I think, understand is that they believe what people who believe in these present day gods, how they present themselves. Mm -hmm. They actually think there's a presence. Mm -hmm. They actually think there's an afterlife. And their behaviors, you know, are somewhat based on that. And it's pretty much, I think it's understandable why people would be very threatened by other ideas mm -hmm. if what's in your brain is gonna save you for eternity. That's uh, blasphemy and heresy and all that. Uh, so I think atheists actually do understand re religions, but they understand it as it's expressed by those who talk about it, not the feel, Logins. I, I wouldn't mind if Immanuel Kant was the only guy, you know, <laughs> talking about it. But, there, you know, there's people justifying their behavior, and they're not, they're, humanism has helped them an awful lot, I'll have to say. But, but the, relig the religions, in my estimation, have had to always kind of drag the humanist aspect of religions have had to drag the mainstream behind them all the way. Mm -hmm. And it's such an arduous task uh, that, I can't, that I can't see how anyone can argue that a more secular approach would be beneficial. I'm, I'm, I always think that you know, Columbus would have had cell phones if we wouldn't cut off the heads of people that didn't think the earth was round and stuff like that. You know, this, this whole dragging down to make sure that the well-being of your God is okay if the well-being of a human being and that, that balance. If you don't have to balance that, you end up with more human, humanism because you're not trying to protect the well-being of a belief system. And I, and I acknowledge that belief systems can be anything. I mean, um, um, you know, yeah, so my, it's not a question, it's a statement, I'll have to admit that. I, I don't understand this, I, I studied, or I didn't actually study, but I went to a whole bunch of meetings about uh, theologians, and it was just this intellectual acrobatics of trying to change what was imagined in the past to a new imagination in the present. Yeah, the, the, well, first of all, I think that, that we actually agree on a lot. I mean, a, a lot of my talk was about, was drawing this distinction between humanistic and anti-humanistic uh, religion. And I, as I understand it, I think that what you were trying to suggest is that, is that in the history of religion, there has been a lot of anti-humanism, and we should deplore it, and I agree with you. Um, the, uh, the, la the, the last question, well, 
I mean, these are the most important questions that occur to human beings, uh, questions of ultimate meaning, uh, whether, whether naturalism is the most compelling worldview that we have, uh, that there is nothing more than the natural universe in space and time, and ultimately, uh, everything can be reduced uh, to that, such as the human mind. Or, on the contra on the, uh, by, by contrast, um, that, uh, there, that other worldviews, uh, like theism, uh, are compelling. And so you would expect um, that on those most difficult questions, um, that theology would be hard, and it is, Thank you. Thank you all for coming very much. Uh, we'll see you on the, in the foyer and we'll talk about God, all right?